But then we have to ask, what is the gospel? And when you look at that word gospel, a one galeon in, in the Greek New Testament, you know that it simply means a message that is described as being a good message. We use that prefix eu uh, in, from the Greek language where we talk about that which is euphonious. It sounds good or euphorious, makes us feel good. But here in this case, it's a, a euangelion, a good message. Let me tell you what the gospel isn't. The gospel is not your personal testimony. I think personal testimonies are a good thing, and we're called to testify the, to the greatness of Christ and what He's meant for us in our lives. It's a wonderful thing. But giving your personal testimony is pre-evangelism. It's not evangelism. Evangelism is proclaiming the gospel. And to say that God loves all people unconditionally is not the gospel. It's not even true. Or to say that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, that's not the gospel. The gospel in the New Testament is the gospel about Jesus his person, who he is, his work, what he has done. I'll say the gospel means that I can be forgiven of my sins. Yes, it does. The gospel means I can have a meaningful life. Yes, it does. But those are consequences and results of God. They're not the gospel. The gospel is a clearly defined message. If you want to see what it is, go to the sermons in the, pre in the preaching of the book of Acts and notice and underscore the content of those sermons. And there you will discover what the gospel is. It's about Jesus, who was born according to the Scriptures and who lived a sinless life, and who died an atoning death on the cross, and for our righteousness God raised Him from the dead and carried Him in glory to heaven for His coronation as our King, and for His installation as our great high priest who ministers for us every day and who will come again at the end of history to bring the fullness of His kingdom, which has begun already, but will not be completely manifested and consummated until His return. Those, that's the objective data of the gospel, but it's only part of the gospel. The rest is the question of the subjective appropriation of the benefits of Christ that accrue to us. So the objective data is the data concerning the person and work of Jesus that is to be received savingly by faith and by faith alone. Rome understood the data, the historical data, believed in the virgin birth, believed in the atonement, believed in the miracles, believed in all that. But in the 16th century, when it came to the subjective side of the appropriation of the benefits of the person and work of Christ, they condemned the gospel, anathematized the gospel, and stopped being a church. What greater sin is there than to deny, to deny 
how we are saved by and through the gospel. That's why Paul said, there's no other gospel. And that gospel has its fullness in, that includes how we are justified by faith. And by faith alone, as he concludes this passage here, when he speaks of the righteousness of God, not that righteousness by which God Himself is righteous, but that righteousness by which we are justified in His presence. Therefore, he comes to the conclusion at the end of this prologue, the just shall live by faith. Therein is the transforming power of the gospel which begins in the mind of God, accomplished by the Son of God, and applied by the power of God in His Holy Spirit. How can you possibly improve on that gospel? If there ever was a fool's errand, it was the errand that people chase when they think they can come up with a better gospel. It's the gospel of God. He composed it, and He commanded it for us and for our people and our children forever. It's His gospel, empowered by His Spirit, that transforms our lives, that must be received in repentance and in faith. Let's pray.